Over the past two years, more than two years, I have made a series of videos based on one book. The book is called Qualitative Inquiry in Everyday Life, written by Svend Brinkman. Brinkman is a Danish psychologist and professor and apparently a public intellectual in Denmark. I have other videos based on his work, some chapters, articles, but on this book specifically, I made, I ended up making 11 videos, which come to a total of more than three hours. Here in this video, which is a retrospective on the past two years, the on and off relationship I had with this book, I want to talk about why this book is important and who it would be useful for. And after listening to me, you can decide for yourself if you want to get the book and read it. At the end, at the very end, I also talk about a new book that I would like to have a similar relationship with over a longer period and making a series of videos based on. So why is this book important? Qualitative inquiry in everyday life, working with everyday life materials. First, the book does something really important. Namely, it removes the boundary between doing research and living a human life. Those two are connected. The book shows that so much of what we are doing in our everyday lives, paying attention to things, being surprised, being puzzled, making sense of what puzzles us, those are essential components of research, formal research. We informally do them. Now, is that the same thing as trying to remove the boundary between researchers, scholars, intellectuals, and lay people, non-academics, non-intellectuals? No, not exactly. But if you are interested in that more community-oriented critique, if you are interested in removing, critiquing, deconstructing the difference, the boundary between intellectuals and non-intellectuals. What Brinkman is doing in this book is a part of that, is an indispensable part of that. It doesn't necessarily lead to that, lead there, to discussing different roles in society, but at the personal level, the activity of one human being, that boundary is removed, which can then lead to other things. The boundary between doing research and living life, living a human life. Okay, so that was the first reason. The second reason the book is important is that it shows the importance of theory in research. Not importance. It's necessity. The necessity of theory. It shows the necessity. Another word I could use, we could use instead of theory, is rationality. The book makes a case for rationality. I don't mean rationalism. I mean rationality, theoretical activity theoretical work in research. There is a tendency, even among academics, very strong tendency to assume that with empirical research, you don't have to think. That somehow, if you have lots of data, the abundance of data can replace, substitute the activity of thinking. This attitude doesn't just destroy research. It destroys the human person. It destroys the human, the thinking animal, the rational animal, the speaking animal, the political animal. It destroys all of that. If it takes full control. I recently watched this debate that exemplifies, it's a, it gives us a perfect example of this uh, tendency, this very destructive tendency. There's a debate about emotions, what emotions are and how they develop between Lisa Feldman Barrett and Mark Solms. And unfortunately, Feldman Barrett embodies this problem. Reliance on authority, reliance on empirical evidence and calling herself an empiricist. She res responds to one of Mark's questions. She says, I'm an empiricist. Don't ask me rational, rationalistic questions. At the same time, she tacitly and in some cases explicitly relies on the authority of scientific communities, the conventions, what is conventionally held to be true, the conventional or common, the consensus over interpretation of a piece of research, piece of findings. So 
that is a tendency against thinking, against thought. It's not just data that replaces thinking for us. Even Brinkman's book or other books that we read on research methods are used as substitute for thought, for decisions based on thinking. Somebody might say, Brinkman said I should follow these steps in my research, so I follow them. Please let my article be published in your journal. I followed Brinkman's five steps to do a research. So reliance on authority and not justifying something. Someone commented on one of my Twitter posts about this book. It was in, this, in the spirit of treating Brinkman as, a, as an authority. It really irritated me. So the person was saying, what do you think about Brinkman? He, in some cases, he disagrees with the consensus of uh, in, in qualitative research community. And my reaction was, dude, you have to think for yourself. You're an academic. Think for yourself. Brinkman shows the importance of thinking in this book and reading thoughtfully, thinking as we read, not just reading to pick up a series of rules and finding what the consensus is and then following that to push your career forward. Okay, so that was the second reason, the importance of theory or rationality. Third, the book shows the richness of everyday life, and this is why the book could be useful, interesting for non-academics. It shows the richness of everyday life. It shows how a research mindset can serve our life, the way we approach life. Our lives are confusing, messy, ambiguous. So much is going on. So much is changing. But qualitative research, the mindset of a good qualitative research, makes us sensitive to the richness of our lives. In addition to the parts of life that are unavoidable, like family, having to work, having to rest, having to deal with other people, having to live in a certain cultural environment. In addition to those, Brinkman also taps into the domains of leisure, the more quote-unquote optional domains of life, like popular culture, media, films, and TV shows, books of fiction, and he shows the potential of these domains for inquiry, for insight, and for enjoyment. Who is this book for? A few different groups of people would benefit from this book, but two of them are especially note worthy of note. <laughs> One, if you have a cursory interest in social science or human science, social sciences, and you want to pursue that interest a little more seriously, try this book. So you're outside of the social sciences, human sciences, but you want to know what it's about, what it could be about, why it might be interesting, engaging, a source of insight. Two, if you're already in social science, psychological science, but you are feeling alienated by it, if you feel like what you're doing is supposed to have a connection to your life, but it fails to connect to your life, and that because of that, you feel like it is not fulfilling its original promise. The reason why you went into psychological science was because you wanted, to, you wanted it to be connected to your life. That's why you didn't go to study biochemistry. If that's the case for you, then this book would be worthwhile because it would show how that would look like, how conducting research that is related, connected to your everyday life. What would that be like? Okay. So for uh, people who support my channel through Patreon, as I said in the beginning of the video, I have made 11 videos. Those videos are Patreon only. Um, I'm always on the lookout for ways to give back to people who have decided to support me. I never take that decision for granted, that generosity. And this 11-part series is one of the best things I have done so far, I think. It's a also a series of videos that enrich our conversations, potentially. Brinkman's style of writing is dry, maybe a little tedious at, at times. So my videos might give you a more efficient overview of the book. In total, as I said, more than three hours of videos, still much shorter than the time it takes to read the book itself. So what you get in the videos is my commentary interspersed 
with selected passages from the book. Now, I was thinking of what to do next, what book to choose and do a close reading discussion, a series of videos, spend a, a bit more time with. One possibility was Jan Valziner's book, 2021 book, General Human Psychology. But I read a couple of chapters from that book and the writing is quite difficult. It's a disaster, the writing. How can such an important thinker write so badly? That's my that's what is puzzling me. So for now, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to discuss that book. Uh, I've decided to dive into this more general book on theory and cultural theory. Uh, the book is called Beginning Theory. You can follow this series, already started. You can follow the series of videos by joining either my Patreon community or joining the YouTube membership. One of those two, not both. One of, them, one of those two would be enough. Otherwise, thank you for your attention. Let me know what you think. If you have any comments, like and subscribe. If you like my videos and consider joining my Patreon community, it would help a lot. Otherwise, bye for now. Talk with you next time.